Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at two distinct groups that usually are seen in one particular light and no other way. Uh, typically, that's a very bad way as well. Barbarians and Vikings. These are two groups which are the bad guys, typically is how they're painted in most medieval age sword and shield type movies, but there's a lot more going on than just a goofy looking Arnold Schwarzenegger and some stoic looking Norsemen. So let's get started. The idea of a barbarian dates back to way before the Greeks. These were guys who had not, as the Greeks called it, civilized. And as the Greek empires, you know, kind of rose and fell with the rise of the Delian League, and then with Alexander's Empire, the barbarians continued to exist, and they were referred to more as just non Greeks. And their origins are kind of all over the place. There are some barbaric groups which would become tribes and clans, and they would stay that way on the edge of what we would label as civilization, sometimes going over that line, and sometimes going back beyond that line. Sometimes these pseudo-tribes would clash with one another. Sometimes they would work together. The best example of them really coming together and causing a major ruckus was the fall of Rome. This was a process which took well over a century. It wasn't just a group of some angry barbarians who decided, hey, Rome, we don't like you anymore and we're going to take you down. This was the culmination of what Rome had become. And by the 5th century, that was decadent, opulent, and crumbling from within. The barbarians helped facilitate the end of the Roman collapse, but they themselves were not the tool of its total collapse. And that's kind of all I've got to say about the barbarians, because I want to spend more time on things, because I think they're just more interesting, and I want to. When we talk about who the Vikings were, they came from Scandinavia. Roughly, we're talking Denmark, Sweden, Norway, regions of these countries that were not actually countries yet. And they're going to be, in some cases, city dwellers, in some cases, tribal individuals. And that's going to delineate as much with the Vikings as it did with the barbarians. And that will prove problematic. The collective Viking Age is going to begin the mid-8th century with the first of the big Viking raids. Now, if you're familiar with this region, great. If you're not familiar with this part of the world, it is harsh to live in. On this map, you can see the Arctic Circle is there, uh, about a third of the way from the northern tip of Norway. And it gets cold, and it stays cold. And... There's not a lot that you can see of rich farmland, and definitely not a long growing season. So these are people who are going to be predominantly fishermen, uh, some livestock, some cattle, but not a lot, because it's so bloody cold. The worse these years get, the harsher it gets for these people, they're going to revert back to something that all humans are you know, ultimately capable of reverting back to. I am going to starve to death if I do not get something to eat. Hey, my neighbor's got some food. I think I'm going to go take their food. Hey, while I'm here, I'll also take the rest of his stuff. And this is going to, in some Viking villages, going to be much more successful than growing of food, getting of fish, surviving in the cold parts, is doing the whole us take your stuff thing. And that's where the bigger legends of the Vikings are going to come from. The, that's the, that's really what we get. Viking villages kind of are all over the place. In some cases, they're really small. In other cases, by the end of the Viking Age, they're really pretty big. And the end of the Viking Age is going to happen by about the end of the 11th century. So Viking Age, as we consider it, last the better part of four centuries. And their social ladder is pretty much defined like this. I mean, you've got your thrall, you've got your king and his wife, then you've got those people who are beneath them, kind of like military lieutenants, 
Uh, your warriors are also going to be in that skill, labor, and trusted retainer group. Uh, you've got your commoners and you've got your slaves. And depending on some Viking villages, those slave groups were very, very big, and in others they were just a couple of individuals. The success of the Vikings was the Drakkar, their warship. It was specifically designed for the fjords of Scandinavia, for the rivers of Eastern Europe, and by the 10th century, even the rivers of Russia, which is where we're going to see Viking settlements are going to start showing up there. These things are long. It can hold the total of 70 rowers, 35 on either side, and sails. They're not too deep, as you can see from either of these pictures. And their origins are kind of all over the place. There's some barbaric groups which would become tribes and clans, and they would stay that way on the edge of what we would label as civilization, sometimes going over that line and sometimes going back beyond that line. Sometimes these pseudo-tribes would clash with one another. Sometimes they would work together. The best example of them really coming together and causing a major ruckus was the fall of Rome. This was a process which took well over a century. It wasn't just a group of some angry barbarians who decided, hey, Rome, we don't like you anymore and we're going to take you down. This was the culmination of what Rome had become. And by the 5th century, that was decadent. Right. One of the reasons the Vikings were so feared is for the Viking warrior, the only way to get to the good afterlife is to die in battle. Dying as an old man, dying as an old person, comfortable at home, surrounded by your loved ones, that is not what they want. They want a glorious death fighting an enemy. That is the only way to reach Valhalla. And there's even some of these soldiers who are even more crazed than than these depicted here. And I mean, there's a woman a shield maiden here. There's a couple of guys depicted here. It is... A cultural thing. The uh, Berserkers are best examples of some of the really kind of over-the-edge Viking warriors. They were the ones who believed they were chosen to fight in almost a bloodlust rage. Uh, sometimes they would not wear armor at all. In some cases these guys would go into battle completely naked just to show look how strong I am, look how great I am, look at how Odin has given me his blessing to fight and to kill in war of all kinds. Uh, and this is why I said if these guys show up, it's okay to run because they might take prisoners, they might take slaves, they might just take heads. So getting out of town is usually a pretty good idea. Viking Age armor has a lot going on to it. I mean, the axe which is depicted on the far right, is a really versatile tool because, you know, first off, it's a tool, and second off, it's just as easily a weapon. Long swords are good, but they're usually owned by those who are very wealthy. The spear is a good long-distance ranged weapon, and it's also the tool of Odin. And in many Viking conflicts, you know, the first thing you do is you throw a spear into battle because, you know, you're sending Odin into battle, uh, kind of christening it. I want to reference the helmet at the top right-hand corner. Uh, and was It's kind of a cultural thing that Viking helmets have horns on them. They don't. That picture there is much more indicative of what Viking helmets looked like. It wasn't until the Wagner series of orchestras and operas did they start adding helmets with horns. Shields, super duper important. They are really mostly, really pretty large anywhere from 36 to 42 inches around, made of wood and metal, and they were designed to take a hit and, you know, even dish out a hit. The only p real weapon that's not here is an Ufbert, which is a long sword that was made of steel. And that's really impressive for a lot of reasons, because Steel Age weapons in 
the Viking Age in Western Europe were extremely uncommon. Finding one would, or having one, you'd need to be a great king to afford it. In the Viking Age, we've only seen a couple of dozen of these things because it's so hard to make and work with. There was a story just a few years ago of a guy who in Scandinavia who was on a walk and he tripped and he just found a cachet of these swords and any one of them would be enough to sell to an archaeological museum for over a million dollars. And that's just like, wow. It's really a impressive feat and kind of impressive like Roman concrete. We don't exactly know how they made them. We have a real good idea of how to do it now, but how it was done then? Shrug. The Viking religion, I've kind of referenced and alluded to it a little bit beforehand. I've talked a little bit about Odin. Their religion, their stories are not just anthropomorphic forces of nature that justify the world and how it is. It's also stories of life and death and humanity and kind of humanity of the gods as well. It's polytheistic. It's told like it had happened or is happening or will happen all kind of at the same time. And one of the biggest ways that it still remained was, well, I talked about death already for dying in battle is good, but if you were a king, you could die and, you know, not be in battle and you'd still get to go to Valhalla, but you need to have a very elaborate series of funeral rites that take place. The Muslim scholar Ibn Fadlan saw one of these and wrote about it and said that they had built a pyre for the dead king on his boat. They put almost all the stuff he had specifically owned on that ship. They killed one of his slave girls and put her on the boat too. Then they set the whole thing on fire. It sounds just like a massive spectacle, the kind of thing that can't even rep really replicate in the 21st century. The Viking language would consist of these runes, which, you know, when we think barbarians, we think Vikings, we think these bloodthirsty animals, but they did have a written language, and it was really, really important to them. These runes were believed to have magical powers, and this kind of dates to the mythology, and it kind of dates to the fact that not everyone could read or write. So if you lived in a culture that, you know, most people can't read or write, the ability to use this skill is a type of magic to them. And here's some runic uh, tombstones that we see from the Viking Age. Some of them very, very detailed, others just explaining, you know, who the person was. A cultural thing. The uh, berserkers are best examples of some of the really kind of over-the-edge Viking warriors. They were the ones who believed they were chosen to fight in almost a bloodlust rage. Uh, sometimes they would not wear armor at all. In some cases, these guys would go into battle completely naked just to show, look how strong I am, look how great I am, look at how Odin has given me his blessing to fight and to kill in war of all kinds. Uh, and this is why I said if these guys show up, it's okay to run, because they might take prisoners, they might take slaves, they might just take heads. So his son, Leif Erikson, was also an explorer, in my opinion, and that of many others, much more significant. Uh, he was the first explorer to reach the Americas. He landed in North America, in northern Canada, and, and voila, the year that we now call Newfoundland. It was discovered by him, and he did this 500 years before Columbus did this. So, you know, just a reminder when the, how history can be forgotten or misinterpreted. The voyages of these Vikings were really all over the place. I mean, there's a lot that happened in Scandinavia, but this map shows and alludes to them entering into the Black Sea as well, and they went the long way to get there. The end of the Viking Age took place, for a lot of historians, in 1066. 
this was where William of Normandy, William the Conqueror, who had been northern French nobility, but his background was that of a Viking raider, when he sets sail from France, goes and conquers England, and becomes high king of all England. This is really the end of it for us, because we see these Viking warriors had established a new kind of kingdom, a new kind of home, and this was theirs. All of this was theirs now. The, and I don't just mean England, I mean just the idea of settling down and building castles, settling down and no longer being raiders. Christianity continued to spread, and that really helped facilitate the end of Viking faith, Viking lifestyle. Uh, the Vikings would work with different people instead of necessarily raiding them. There'd still be some people who would act as Viking raiders, but again, we're talking about a real small percentage of this group. The iconic incidents happened in the Middle Ages of when Christians and Christian missionaries would go out to their way to really try to take and remove the powers of the old Viking gods. There's a story of a tree that was called Thor's tree, and when a group of missionaries went there, the tree fell down. And they justified that, well, this is Christianity defeating the old ways. Uh, a berserker was once asked, you know, if his if he believed Odin was stronger or weaker than a Christian deity. And when missionaries built a fire, they asked if he could walk through it. And he said, no, because, you know, it's fire. And they argued, well, you know, voila, there's our argument. The collapse of the Viking Age has left the Vikings as these... individuals who are kind of prescribed to a different part of history than ours. It's a tale of fantasy, a land of differences, but it is still part of the collective history of us all. So, I hope you learned something today. I hope you see that these guys were much more complicated than we typically give them, and I'll see you next time.